Would you please open your Bible to Romans chapter 14? And we're going to begin reading in verse 13. Romans 14, beginning of verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have keep between yourself and God, blesses the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Let's pray. Lord, you're so good. I, we started off the time together telling you of your goodness to us. You're the good father. And so now, because you are a good father, you want your children to get along. You give us wisdom and understanding, this knowledge that will help us as we're doing life together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, Father, would you help us with that this morning? Would you give us an understanding of what this looks like for um, us as we do church, as we um, are together. I know this has ramifications not for just when we're in this building. This has ramifications for when we're out and about, when we're in our homes, when we're um, fellowshipping with one another, when we're not, when we're in the community. What does church look like? to those that are watching, let alone to you as that sole audience. And so, Father, would you help us with this today? It would be very easy to come to a text like this and act like we've got this all down and all figured out. And I'm asking you for each of us, God, um, that you'd help us where we're at. And we're so grateful for your patience with us as, as, our, as our Heavenly Father. And we pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. I don't know if this ever happens for you as we're working through different contexts that you see or sense um, a repetition or a repetitiveness that goes on. When I was working through Acts with you years back, uh, there was times where I was like, he just got done saying this, this last chapter. He just got done saying this in this last context. We get it. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm actually saying this to the Holy Spirit. I can't believe I'm saying this, but this is what I'm saying in my mind, especially as, a, as pastor, as, I, as I'm putting together messages, I'm putting together sermons. I want to be fresh for you. I want to be... Um, in the words of my father, not chewing my cabbage twice, you know, that you would hear this, this context and it would, be, it would be not necessarily new to you, but it would be like 
hey, thank you for making this different than you did last week, even though it's the same stuff from last week. That's why Christmas time, and you know how I love to, to I love Christmas, that we're three months away. <laughs> that some of you are like, oh, thank you. Uh, but um, Christmas time, the story doesn't change. You do know that. Uh, but I want to come at it from fresh vantage point, and so I've been here. Uh, this will be my 20th uh, Christmas time with you Advent series and we do it for four weeks and uh, so trying to trying to make that fresh without preaching heresy you know I, I want to preach the truth is uh, it can be interesting but God repeats himself God does chewish cabbage twice all right and he's willing to do that he's willing to say something over and over again and 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 it causes us or should cause us to stop and go why do you do that god why why do you do that well there's a few reasons one we are prone to forget every time we have um men's breakfast roy's got a bunch of guys that he texts and I don't know about you guys, I appreciate that. And I work here, all right? But there, you get busy, you're doing life, and, and there's something about getting that gentle reminder of, hey, uh, tomorrow's going to be men's breakfast, you know, are you coming? That's a good thing. There's times where as I'm driving through Warrington, and I go through that patch between where Kroger used to be and up downtown, you know, we're, we're our big, big city here, all right? But there's that stretch on 47 that I call the black hole of Warrington where police just seem to wait. And if you're, you go over 30, they could stop you. And they have every right to stop you. And I can be driving through that. And Kim, if she's with me, reminds me about that. And there's times I want to turn to her and go, you do know that, that I've made it home safely without a ticket for a long time now. In fact, I've driven longer than you in my life. I'm digging too deep a hole here. Uh, <laughs> but why does she do that? It's because she loves me and she doesn't want me to get a ticket either. But it's, it's a reminder out of love to say, hey, this, this, I'm trying to help you out here. So God, in his wisdom, goes, I've got to say these things to you. I've got to tell you this because you're prone to forget. So that's one reason. Secondly, I think why this happens is, is because it's important we repeat what we deem as important. And sometimes some of the things that we would repeat aren't really that important, but we feel that way, and so we bring it up again. God, I know you've heard me say this before, God is like really smart, like all-knowing, all-wise. And so if he's repeating himself, you got to go, huh. This must be important. There, this, has, this should be heard. This should be obeyed. So that's the second reason. It, we've, we're prone to forget and it's important. But thirdly, there's an interconnectivity to doctrine, to theology. And because of that, He's building on something as he's teaching us. Because he's smart, because he's wise, and he's all-knowing, he knows that we need to have this understanding as we're looking at this book of Romans and that first 11 chapters are packed with what I've done for you, doctrine-wise, what I've done so that you can know that you know. And then I move to the practical section, which is what we're in right now, the, the 12, chapter 12, where he starts out. And I know you heard me say it last week, but maybe you weren't here. That I, 
I want you to give me your body. And I like that he says that instead of just give me your mind. That's part of the body. But it's all of me. He wants all of me. And then he says, I don't want you to be conformed to the world. You watch the world system, and the world system, and it's doing this. The, the picture there is he's, it's conforming us to a mold. It's, it's pressing us. Do you ever feel that? you ever feel like the world is just, its whole goal is to just squeeze you so that you become the shape of what they want? And he says, I don't want you to be conformed. I want you to be transformed, and it's it comes through, re, through the renewing of your mind. And part of that is tied to what am I taking in all week? You're here right now. We're working through this together. And I believe this is a work of God as we're allowing the scriptures to wash over us by the spirit of God. But if that's the only time that you're taking in scripture, that's the only time that you're taking in the word, could you imagine if the, the only time you're washing up is that one time a week. And some of you are like, that's how I grew up. Could you imagine what we smelled like? He wants us to, to have an understanding of and just allow this. And we've got so many resources today in this free country that we have. We can, we can actually pick up the Bible and read it without fear. So God wants us to get this. In fact, that's another reason why we here at Grace Bible Church appreciate or lean toward what is called expository preaching. And that is, we're going to work through books of the Bible. Every now and then we'll do topical. There's nothing wrong with that. But the temptation for topical would be, okay, I said it that once, and let's move on. I got it. But if I'm doing expository, which is working through a book verse by verse, and God repeats himself, you're stuck with how God gave us the message. And, and so that's why we do what we do here. A lot of reason why we emphasize Sunday school is Sunday school is very topical. Oh, we're going to deal with marriage issues. We're going to deal with family issues. We're going to deal with this, 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 and this. Also a time for interchange. So... So we have this, and we come to this passage of Scripture, and some of the things that he's going to say here, we talked about last week. But he's repeating it. He's, he's saying stuff, but he's also repeating it with the sense of, and I'm going to build on what I talked about last week with you. Last week I, I, I shared with you what this looks like from this vantage point. Now I'm going to say, that stuff right there, I want you to have an understanding so that you'd even have an understanding of what, what it means to love a brother or sister with that knowledge. He's truly discipling us. So Romans 14 is smack dab in the middle of Romans 13 and 15. I know you're like, boy, you know math. You know numbers. That's really good. But 13 was talking about my mission field of those that are around me to show them love and, and, and how to reach them for Christ. 15 is how to expand that to the world. But he goes, I'm going to drop 14 right in the middle of that, that, that right in the middle of that sandwich. I'm going to drop that, and it's that meat that says to you and me, how do I play well with one another? And if I don't get 14 right, I'm really not going to be um, very successful with 13, and I'm not going to be successful at all with 15. So that's God's graciousness to us. Look at, look at Jesus dealing with something, something of an issue of this in Mark 7. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. 
And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. I love this, how he would um, have these men that he's spending this time with. They, he would hear them, they would hear him say stuff, and then, then they got him alone. And, and by the way, this is beautiful, because we basically are getting alone with Jesus here. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. So he goes, that, that food, that drink, ultimately it's going to turn into something else, gets out of you. Okay? And I like this parenthesis. I want you to notice that this is Mark saying something that at the time they wouldn't necessarily have completely understood. But since Mark is written years after, it's after Jesus has died, after he's been buried, rose again, he's giving us a parenthetical statement here that's actually tied to like Romans 14. Thus he declared all foods clean. That's not a very Jewish statement from the Old Testament, but it's Mark having insight into what, oh, that's what he was doing. You ever have that? Something hits you later that somebody said, oh, that's what they were saying. That's what happened with uh, the disciples there. And, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. That's why I'm emphasizing with you on a regular basis, you will hear people say they'll do something that, you know, whoa. And they go, oh, I'm sorry, that's not me. And you go, yes, it is. That is you. That, that's, that's you. It's not necessarily okay, but it's okay because then you have an understanding, hey, that's me. I have the potential of this kind of stuff is in there. And all that happens a lot of times is certain circumstances make these things come out of us. When the pressure comes, that something comes up, and you're like, where, where was that? It was there. And that's the, that's the beauty and the hard part about hard times. Because it allows us to go, oh, God, you've got to work in me because that's what's in me. Because when the pressure comes and you squeeze me, this is the juice that comes out. And God wants us to get to the point that so as he's conforming us to him, his image, all of the, the bad stuff he's working out of us. And we're growing deeper in maturity. So let's, let's get into this together. If you're taking notes, there's a section in the back of your bulletin to do just that. Point number one, let's not be stumbling blocks. Let's not be stumbling blocks. Look at verse 13 with me again. Therefore, so you know what therefore is uh, when you see that in Bible study or in a book or however you would say. Therefore is always you got to figure out, okay, what's it there for? It's a, it's, a, it's a conjunction that's joining us to what was just talked about. And he's saying, so you know all this stuff. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. But rather, decide never, look at that, decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Sprinkled throughout Paul's writings are these negative exhortations directly followed by positive applications. And so we see this word stumbling block here, these words stumbling block, that something carelessly left about over which someone st stumbles. You, you, put it, you put something there, and you didn't mean to necessarily, but you did, and somebody trips over it. That's why around our house I try as often as I take my shoes off that I'm sliding them under tables, I'm you know, moving it over, putting it, putting it where it actually belongs. You know. But I don't keep it in the middle of the room because it could be a stumbling block, especially in the dark. This word hindrance is something that's deliberately left to ensnare another. So look, he uses both words. Something that just could be laid there, 
Didn't necessarily mean it to be the case, but it was laid there. And then something that was purposely laid there. But I like that he gives these negative exhortations. They're followed by a positive application. He does a few times. Look at this. Ephesians 4.28. Let the thief no longer steal. So if you've got an issue with stealing, don't do this anymore. But I've got something that, could, that you could do differently. But rather let him labor, let him work, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Another one, Ephesians 4.25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, so I'm, I'm taking something that's negative, I'm not going to lie anymore, let each, of one, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So I've got this negative thing, get this out of here, and instead of, because we've talked about this before, the junk drawer thing. You ever have a junk drawer? Come on, everybody's got a junk drawer. Some of you are like, i got a junk house, all right? But you got a junk drawer, and you go, I'm going to clean out the junk drawer. And you, you clean it out. How long before it becomes a junk drawer again? But if it becomes a drawer with a purpose, this is the one that has the phone book. And I know I said phone book like they exist anymore, but just pretend with me. There used to be these things called phone books, all right, that you'd sit on if you were little, you know. But you could imagine that this is what, and this is what God knows. He goes, I, I'm not going to leave you with a vacuum. You used to steal, I don't want you to steal anymore. You used to lie, I don't want you to lie anymore. 2 Timothy 2, 22. So flee youthful passion. So I, I want you to stop doing things like that. But here's what I do want you to run after. I want you to pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And then Philippians 4, verse 6 do not be anxious about anything. Boy, in a time of anxiety. What a verse. I don't want you to, I don't want you to fear anything. I don't want you to, I don't want you to be, but just like have these things eat you up. Here's what I want you to do with that time that you, where you'd be anxious. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So this is the pattern. I'm, I, you have this. As a negative, I want you to allow me to move that out of your life, and then I want you to allow me to have this take residence. So Paul is saying this about judging. He's saying, is your legalism causing others to stumble by making them feel condemned or weighed down and beaten up? You're adding things to the Scriptures and you are putting judgment on people because they don't line up with your definition of how things should be. Your things of conscience. And we listed those last week. If you, if you weren't here, you can get that message. And, and I could have gone all day with that stuff. There's, there's so many things that people will look at and they go, well, that's obviously wrong. Well, it's wrong to them. But there's enough written in the Bible to work on without adding extras. And some of us, and we do this because we care, we build these fences because I don't even want to get close to that thing. And that becomes a conviction about for us because it could be a weakness in our lives. So I don't even want to get close so I'm not going to have this thing near me. And, it, and it's worked for you. God has allowed that to, to work for you. The problem is that when you look at other people and they have a thing, and it isn't sin, but you go, you should have those same standards. And I'm going to put that on you. And you wonder, why, why don't people want to spend any time with me? You keep doing that. And there's a freedom that comes when we stick with the book. But then there's the other side. He's saying, is your liberty causing others to stumble as they follow you to their own destruction? So let's say somebody does have a conviction in area. Let's say there was somebody, they had a, an issue concerning alcohol. And we know from the scriptures, the scripture says the issue with alcohol is drunkenness. The, the issue with that is, and I could pick, I could pick up a lot of things. I could pick gluttony. 
I was in a Baptist church for years. I'd hear a lot of alcohol sermons, but I didn't hear a lot of gluttony sermons. And there were some fat pastors, I'm telling you. <laughs> and some of you are looking at me. <laughs> but we'll move on. Right? <laughs> but the, re the thing is, if something isn't your issue, it's, not, it's no big deal to you. It's not, it's not a big deal to you. And so, but you come across somebody, and maybe they had a family member that that was an issue. Or they struggled with it at times. And you could be with that person, and you plop down a Bud Light, you pop down whatever. Hey, you know, I just found a new freedom. I, I can do this. And, so I, and that person, they're like, they're like oh, go ahead. It won't, it won't hurt you. You wouldn't do that. Because you know that's their issue. That's their thing. Even though it isn't sin for you because you have freedom in that area. This whole rest of this chapter is because you love someone, you would never do that. You would never push that, whatever that is. And I just picked that one issue. There's other issues that as you start talking to people, you go, hmm, that's there. And you could go, well, my goal in life is to educate them so that we all have the freedom to live like this. And God has placed us all in this church together to go, no, I don't want you to do that. Let me bring them to that point. If that day would ever come, and they could do that without sinning. It would be very difficult if that's an issue. Then let God do it. But he's saying here that if you push that, you aren't very loving. And you're causing them to almost head toward a life of destruction. We have to judge ourselves, is what the word is constantly saying. You want to judge? Judge yourself. One point of clarification that I want to emphasize. He's not talking about truly sin issues. Now, something that, something that you need to always remember, though, is you don't know someone's heart and you don't know someone's motives. Some of you are like, I know, I just know. All right, all knowing one. But have you ever had that? I've watched, I just saw a movie this week where there was um, an individual that ended up going to prison for 20 years, and the whole story makes you think that she did what led to that. And then you get near the end of the movie, and some questions are started asking, you find out, oh, But she never said. And she took it. And the whole time I'm like, yeah, she deserved it. And then I find out the truth. If we ever took time honestly to hear each other's stories and to listen, it would slow down some judgmentalism, honestly. Why we do what we do. But we don't necessarily have all the time to go, hey, just so you know, the reason I'm an idiot here. It take a lot of time. But here's what God says. Out of love, I wouldn't live to judge people. I'd really take account of myself more often. God loves us well. He gives us liberty. He loves us well. There's a similar bit of advice that we see in this verse in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. That you and I, the, the, the issue here is not necessarily the person that is easily offended. The issue here is the person that's weak in faith and they don't believe they should be doing something. And by us pushing our liberty, we, by the way, we have the knowledge we're right, truly right in the fact that we are not sinning when we do this thing. But by us pushing it, we could cause them to sin. And he's saying, please be the mature one. If you're the strong one, 
be that. You know what that's like. You know, we talked about it last week. The older kid and the younger one. And the older kid is confronted because you know better. At least they should know better. And the younger one is, and you're, some of you, I know you're sitting there going, that younger one always gets away with stuff. They always get their way. Oh, no. Kids, young people, I want you to know, parents most of the time know that something's going on. All right. It's just we want some peace. <laughs> None of the young people were laughing on that. <laughs> this emphasis here is proposing the need to be guided by the other believer's best interest rather than one's own sense of freedom. I, I love my brother or sister in Christ enough to say no to myself. Look at verse 14. I know, well, that's beautiful. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. Isn't that that's powerful? There are some people that the world is just so black and white, and much of it is. But there are times where there could be two different people doing the same activity. One is sinning, one is not. You're like, how does that work? And it's because against their conscience, they are doing something against their conscience. They know, but in their heart, they're, well, they're doing it, or, or I guess it's okay, but it's still eating at them. I shouldn't do this. I'm doing it. It's sin. He's implying that he's, Paul implies here that he's the one, he considers himself strong. We'll see that in the first verse of the next chapter. He has this firm conviction grounded in his relationship with Christ. So we see that this is where the weak can stumble. Their own misguided conscience can make them feel guilty when objectively they are not. Any particular food is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. That's brutal. Could you imagine what somebody that's weak in faith is dealing with and that we should be gracious and, and patient with that person? They're still working through those things? Let's keep going. Verse 15. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Am I getting this right, God? You're saying, I've got to be conscious of the people that are around me when I do what I do? Mm -hmm. That's love. But I'm free. I, I, I'm free. Why, why would this be? You're free to love. Huh. This is family life. I like how um, Kent Hughes in in this commentary, is working through this with us. And he says, he talks about Martin Luther. Martin Luther had it right when he began his treatise on the freedom of a Christian man by saying, a Christian man is a most free Lord of all, subject to none. So think about it. We like the, yeah, subject to none. A Christian man is a most dutiful servant of all, Subject to all. I thought you just told me I was subject to none. And now, because I love you, I'm willing to put aside certain things. That's rough. Mm -hmm. But don't we like that in family life? Don't we like that? Don't we like that when we see our kids willingly, they don't have to, give up certain things because it's out of love? for their brother or sister. We love that. We want that. But that doesn't sound like freedom. You're free to love. Would you like a spouse like that? Constantly thinking of your best interest? This is gold. Then be that spouse. But there, but I'm always the okay. 
God must really be working on you. But that's love. Verse 16. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. What you regard as good describes the freedom to eat that at which the weak would just bristle at. Or it could be the food itself that one feels free to eat. But if a strong believer flaunts that freedom from that, those customs, this, this would be the spoken of as evil part. We could be I'm not doing anything wrong. Be this free Christian. Be in, in people's face about the way. You can't stop me. You're not the boss of me. Remember that actually I do have a debt to pay earlier in Romans. My debt is to love you, to care about you. Ephesians 4, verse 3. Here's what God's calling on our lives is he wants us to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Boy, that just stops me in my tracks because there's so many things I want to do. And he's saying, if you love, you won't think like that. Verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And he's speaking comparatively, the kingdom of God and its chief concerns, like love for one another, unity in the church. You see those things listed. This is what the kingdom of God is all about, righteousness and peace and joy. But he's saying, you and I, if we're not careful, we can elevate our freedoms over those things. And when you stop and think about it, although we do love it, food and drink aren't that big of a deal. I know you're, oh, what are you saying? Because we, I mean, let's face it, we like it. Right now, if I get you guys going, I could get you thinking about lunch really fast. Because it's just, it's our appetites. That's why you pick those things. And those things are so normal to think about. But he's saying, I want you to be somebody that loves one another so much that you would not elevate these earthy things over their heart, over their spirit, over their importance. And it's so easy to do. It's just, it's just, and so he, he goes out of, out of loving us and the fact that that's how you'll grow. You want to mature in your, in your walk? It's so much of it is tied to being a servant. It's saying no to yourself. Verse 18. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Acceptable is often translated pleasing. Boy, I just want to be pleasing to God. You know what would please God? He sees you as his son or daughter and you love your brother and sister so much that you're willing to say no to you for this time. And by the way, that doesn't mean that you give that thing up forever. He's given you freedom in that area. But there are times when you would say, I don't want to say no, I'm free. You see how much that looks like a tantrum? We wouldn't necessarily act that out physically, but that's how we feel. So what, what's the calling of God in our lives? I don't, I don't want you to be a stumbling block. It starts out with the negativeness. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be a stepping stone. So point number two, let's be stepping stones. Look at verse 19. So then, let us pursue. That word, think about that when you pursue something. Some of you guys are hunters. Boy, you got this down to a science. You certain kind of spot. You get it all set up. I've heard about some of your deer stands. What is up with that? I want to be invited just to sit up there and be all powerful. But you've thought it out. 
That's, that's your pursuit. And he's saying to you, that's just an earthy thing. It's a good thing. It's a fun thing. It's a, it's a free thing. That's just, here's what I want. Here's what I want you to truly pursue in your walk. Let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That's what I want. I want you to think, how can I have peace? How can I build up my brothers and sisters in Christ and pursue that as if it's that thing or person that you pursued? You think about this, guys, when you're pursuing that girl. How you wanted to look, you planned out the date and everything. Why? Because that was important to you. Should still be. God says, here, here's how I want you to pursue this, and I, here's what I want you to pursue. And that right strategy should be in place. That's verse 18 is the right strategy. And the proper goal is now seen in verse 19. What makes for peace and Deep down, isn't that what we want? Don't you want peace? I know every now and then it's fun to, if you've ever been a part of something, you're just watching and there's some bit of chaos going on at Christmas time and it's just fun to watch the kids and the grandkids doing life like that. But if it was all the time, so you want peace. And then to have mutual upbuilding, that's that edification, that's that building up. Understand this, church is never to be a place for self-promotion. I elevate myself. But it should be opportunities to seek the best for fellow believers. I want the best for you. Look at verse 20. Do not, for the sake of food, look, look at this next word, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. And I know you know this, but destroy is the opposite of upbuilding. It's so easy to do that, isn't it? Destruction. Some of these shows, I hear about demo day. And for you and I to fail to build up is to tear down. And this work of God here, it applies to the whole congregation. This word, however, it would also be wrong if the shoe were on the other foot. Look at that again with me. Verse 20. It is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. Um, back in the 80s, as I was working through these different concepts. Uh, there were other issues that the churches were dealing with at times, and we've moved past. It's just interesting how Satan will bring up new things. But there's a guy named Joe Aldrich who wrote a book called Lifestyle Evangelism. It was very popular, talking about building relationships and ultimately being able to share the gospel with people through those relationships. But he had a, a phrase that he coined back then that I thought was interesting. I've never forgot it. He talked about a professional weaker brother. So we've been talking about weak and strong. Weak brothers, strong brothers. Weak sisters, strong sisters. There are people, and I saw a lot of it in the past, that lived to be offended. I don't know if you've ever met them. They they didn't like new music or them drums in the church or what's this, you know, and they, and they would talk about the organ as the only instrument that should be played in church, not realizing that the organs actually started in bars, all right? We went a little history. You bring that up. It was actually called by some preachers when it was brought into the church the devil's windbag. I'm not kidding. Aldrich was trying to get across the fact that there are people that you and I will come in contact with live to be offended. Over the years as a pastor, 
I've gotten letters from different individuals that want to educate me. And it's okay. If you want to write a letter, that's fine. But they would be offended about this. And, and these are people that if people, if I were to say, hey, this is the person that wrote that letter, and I would say to you who that person, oh, they're just so godly. And if I showed you a letter, godly? But it was because it was their thing that was being pushed against. And God is saying, I don't want you to live as a weaker brother and just stay there and have everybody cater to your way of doing things. But that we understand, oh, that's your thing. Oh, I never thought about it from that angle. And I could go through the list of things, but we don't have time. And that's why he says, he uses eating and drinking, he uses days, he uses these general things that they were dealing with, with an understanding that we would take these principles and go, Oh, how do I do church life? And a lot of it is I stick with the fact that God is doing a work in my life. I've got to give, cut people slack. And if I did see something, and I want to stress this with you, if I did see something that was sinful or I sensed something, that I wouldn't right away jump to motives. But they say, hey, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But here's something I'm seeing out of love, because I think we need to do this for one another. I'm seeing this, and I don't want to judge your motives. I don't, but because I love you, is everything okay? How are you doing? And I hope we'd be honest with one another, because sometimes we could even lie then, which is another sin. And some people, by the way, I don't want to tell them. But if somebody loves you enough to say that, that's love. Let's wrap this up. Verse 21, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. And by the way, another thing is we live in an era of social media and we could put things out and act like it's okay and we're communicating something to people that isn't necessarily helpful for them. We've got to understand as I put those things out, I'm even communicating something. Verse 22, the faith that you have keep between yourself and God. This is a great thing, I'm telling you. This is a, such a good verse for all of us, especially those that have been Christians a long time and we would hope that we've even matured. But I would hope that if there came a day where you would say no to yourself on something, that you would go, you know, right about now I could do this thing, but because I love you, I'm not doing it. <laughs> oh, that's mature. That's why he's saying, if God has done that work, keep it to yourself. You don't have to trumpet that you're such an amazing Christian. Keep that to yourself. It's between you and God. Isn't that cool to have that thing with between? <laughs> You're helping me because I'm an idiot in this other area. Right? Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. This is a good verse, this next one. They're all good verses. But, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. When in doubt, don't. Because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. And I know some of you are like, ah, we got to be more risk takers. Not with sin. In other areas, zip line, climbing things. I could keep going, but those are good risks, but when it comes, you know in your heart something's wrong with this. I don't think I should do this. Don't. Let me take you back to 1977 with me. Boy, isn't it great? Albert Pujols got 700 home runs. I mean, come on, come on, seriously. Amen. It's amazing. And some of you are like, it's not that big of a deal. It's a big deal. That's history. We've got to see history. Now you're like, why are we ending the sermon on this? Back in 77, there was a guy named Billy Martin who was coaching the New York Yankees. And there was a player he had that was one of the highest paid players back then, this guy by the name of Reggie Jackson. 
and there was a game in Boston that he actually he benched him. And you see Reggie wasn't happy about it as he's going back to the dugout. And they got into it, and it was on national TV. Howard Cosell, I cannot believe what's going on. And you saw the, them going back and people having to pull Martin, pull Jackson away from one another. And it, it, it was eating at the Yankees. It was, it was detrimental to the team. And then you got George Steinbrenner yelling at Billy Martin, well, I'm paying that guy a lot of money. I didn't pay you to bench him. But this is a good team. And in 77, uh, they're in the... Uh, American League Championship Series, and, and let me read this, and this is out of Kansas City. Sorry, you Royals fans, but I'll mention the In the 167th, this is from the New York Times, in the 167th and last game of the American League season with the championship at stake, manager Billy Martin of the New York Yankees decided tonight to bench Reggie Jackson, the highest-priced player in the history of baseball. It's back in 77. The news impact of his decision was what might have been expected an explosion of pregame interviewing that obliterated most other aspects of the final game of the three of five playoff game playoff. It's not a decision I'm happy making, says Martin, but I had to do it. I probably wouldn't in the World Series, but I just had to do it now. There's nothing you enjoy doing, nothing you enjoy doing, but if I didn't do it for the ball club, I shouldn't be managing. Jackson, who was told of the decision about two hours before game time, stayed in the clubhouse during most of batting practice. Then he came out to the field where he said, Sure, I'm surprised. You've got to be down. Your pride's got to be hurt. But if a man tells me I'm not playing, I don't play. I sit down and pull for the club. I'm not the boss. I'm the right fielder. Sometimes. If you knew what was going on that whole season in New York, there are, the Son of Sam murders are going on, so the, the city's in tension already. Um, they had a blackout that was famous back in 1977 at this time. And so everybody's, putting, everybody's loving the Yankees. They're, they've made it this far, and he's benching him. But what was happening, and Millie Martin knew this, and a lot of people didn't know, there was a guy named Paul Splitorf that was the uh, pitcher for Kansas City, and he owned Reggie Jackson. And Billy Martin knew that. And so he decided to play a guy named Paul Blair instead. And Reggie Jackson, in the past through the season, was reacting in a way that wasn't helpful to the team. But at this point, you heard what he said. He goes, I'm going to, and he, what would happen in that game against Kansas City if his teammates were doing, he was out clapping for them. He was, he was supporting them. He was rooting for them. He put aside himself for the team. Oh, something else happened that year. They won that game. And they went to the World Series against the Los Angeles Dodgers. Let's show you what happened in one of the games with Reggie Jackson. Reggie Jackson. Long drive right field. Oh, it is. Goodbye. A big, big World Series for Reggie. This is all one game. All the palaver about his discontent with Billy Mott as he comes up with his third home run of the series. Quickly, the Yankees go ahead.
Reggie Jackson's last at bat, probably in the 1977 series. What a colossal blow! And that was a monster in itself. 475 feet, probably. Look at that. Look at Torres. You don't think they know it? Feel it in there? You know what nickname he got out of that? He was nicknamed Mr. October, and he still has that name. Why? Because he was willing at one point to say, Coach, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll sit here. I'll root for my teammates. Because they matter, not just about me. And then at the time, and then some of you are like, man, when am I going to have my Mr. October moment? All right. That's up to God. But would you be willing to say to the Lord, I'll do or not do because I love my brother or sister in Christ? What a high and holy calling we have. And it makes us stop and think about what we're doing. Why do I do these things? Should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? And you don't have to do it all the time. And it's, you're gonna, Man, that's er No, but you know. And that's love. And you, and I'm stressing this, you would want that in your family. You would love that your kids would think that way. Because selfishness is ugly. Let's pray.